begins with the Women's Business Center and the program coordinator. And um, we're going to get started on time. We had about 50 people registered for this class and uh, notifications went out at least three times. So we're going to go ahead and get move forward and get started. And Anika is with us. She's with the Internal Revenue Service. This is doing the presentation today and I'm going to let her further introduce herself and get started. If at all possible, please um, uh, turn on your mics. It's so much easier to talk to people as opposed to a blank screen. Um, so we would appreciate that on this end. Anika? Good morning, everyone. Is my audio good? Yes, your audio is excellent. Okay, great. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Anika Pompey, and as Ms. Giddens mentioned, I am uh, with the Internal Revenue Serv Service. Uh, I am a senior stakeholder liaison. And in my role as senior stakeholder liaison, I'm responsible for doing um, outreach and spreading IRS messaging to uh, tax professionals and uh, industry and associations. Um, so today we are going to be discussing, uh, today's topic is, is going to be uh, record keeping. And this particular topic is uh, very near and dear to me because uh, prior to becoming a senior stakeholder liaison, I was actually empo employed in um, IRS exam for about 10 and a half years. I spent uh, seven and a half years as an auditor and then another three, maybe three and a half um, as, a, as a manager for a group of auditors. So as you can imagine, um, you know, for more than 10 years, uh, I've dealt with uh, business owners and had to, uh, and their, their records. And I had to do a lot of educating um, in these instances in regard to how to maintain your records and keep your records because uh, there were times where people would come in for audits and they would they would have absolutely nothing. Um, and it's, it's very important for uh, businesses to maintain good records uh, and not just for audit purposes, but um, so you can measure the success of your business. Today, we are going to discuss the uses of record keeping. Uh, we're going to discuss how to document income and expenses. We'll also discuss uh, record keeping systems as well as record keeping timeframes. All right, so as you know, everyone in business must keep records. Uh, keeping good records is very important to your business and it's gonna help you in several ways. So the first way it will help you is um, by monitoring the progress of your business. Uh, you're gonna need good records to monitor the progress of your business. Uh, records can show whether your business is improving, uh, what items are selling, what changes need to be made, and good records can increase the likelihood of your business's success. Uh, they also assist with preparing your financial statements. So you need good records to prepare, your, prepare accurate financial statements. Uh, these include income statements, which are your profit and loss statements, as well as your balance sheets. Uh, these statements can help you in dealing with your bank or creditors, and um, it'll help you manage your business. So an income statement is going to show the income and expenses of the business for a given time period, and your balance sheet is going to show the assets and liabilities and your equity in the business on a given date. Uh, good records can also uh, help you identify sources of receipts. Um, you will receive money or property from many sources uh, throughout, throughout, you know, operating your business. So your records can help you identify the source of your receipts and you need this information so you can separate business from non-business receipts and taxable from non-taxable income. Record keeping also allows you to track your deductible expenses. So you may forget expenses uh, when you prepare your tax return unless you record them when they, uh, when they occur. And we'll, we'll talk about more about that in a bit. Um, your records also help you prepare your tax returns. So uh, you need good records to prepare your tax returns and your records must support the income expenses and credits you report on your income tax return. Um, generally, these are the same records you use to monitor your business and prepare your financial statements. 
Uh, lastly, um, like I just mentioned, you're going to uh, your records are going to support items reported on your tax return. So you must keep your business records available at all times for inspection by the IRS. If the IRS examines any of your tax returns, you may be asked to explain the items that you reported and a complete set of records will speed up the examination. So you can choose any record keeping system suited for your business, um, as long as it clearly shows your income and expenses. Except in a few cases, the law does not require any kind of any special kind of records. However, the business you are in affects the type of records you need to keep for, your, for federal tax purposes, and your record keeping system um, should also include a summary of your business transactions. Um, this summary is ordinarily made in your business books, for example, um, accounting journals or ledgers, and your books must show your gross income as well as your deductions and credits. So for most small businesses, uh, the business uh, checkbook or your business bank account is uh, a main source for uh, entries in um, your business books. Okay, so let's move on to talking about supporting documents. So your supporting documents are going to be um, purchases, sales, uh, payroll, or other transactions that you have in your business um, and these are going to generate supporting documents such as invoices and receipts. Supporting documents um, can include the sales slip, the paid bills, invoices, receipts, deposit slips, and cancel checks. Uh, these documents contain the information you need to record in your books. And it is important to keep these documents because they support the entries in your books and on your tax return. You should keep them in an orderly fashion and in a safe place. For instance, organize them by year and type of income or expense. Uh, for more information, for more detailed information, you can refer to uh, publication 583, starting a business and keeping records. Uh, the system that you use to record your business transactions will be more effective if you follow good record keeping practices. For example, you should record expenses when they occur and identify the source of uh, recorded receipts. Generally, it's best to record transactions on a daily basis. Um, I understand that, you know, operating a business the day in, the day in and day out, um, it may not be feasible to record your expenses and income on a daily basis. But I, I do strongly suggest that you not wait any longer than uh, a week to record um, income and expenses. So, you know, just carve out some time in your calendar um, each week uh, so that you can record your income and expenses. And that way um, you won't have to, you won't have a lot to do if you, uh, at, the, at the time of filing season and um, it's less likely that you'll make any mistakes because you've, you've taken the time to organize those documents. All right. So, uh, so one of the first things you should do when you start a business is you're going to open a business checking account, and you should keep your business account separate from your personal account. Um, this this is very important. Um, your business uh, account is your basic source of information for recording. Um, I'm sorry, your business checkbook checkbook or ledger is going to be your basic source of information for recording your business expenses. And you should deposit all daily receipts into your business checking account. Um, you should check your account for errors by reconciling it uh, periodically. So you should also uh, make all payments using your business account um, to document the business expenses when possible. Um, if you are gonna write checks payable to yourself, um, only do that to make withdrawals from your business for personal use. Avoid writing checks that are payable to cash. Uh, if you have to write a check that's um, for cash to pay a business expense, make sure you include the receipt for the cash payment in your records. And if you can't get a receipt for the cash payment, you should make uh, you should document an adequate explanation in your records um, at the time of payment. So again, use the business account for business purposes only. 
um, and indicate the source of deposits and the type of expenses in uh, your checkbook if you maintain a business checkbook. All right, so let's talk about gross receipts for a moment. So gross receipts is pretty much, we define that as the income you receive from your business. Um, you should keep supporting documents that show the amount and source of your gross receipts and your documents can include, um, and but, but aren't limited to um, any cash register tapes, um, bank deposit slips, receipt books, invoices, uh, credit card charge slips in any form um, 1099 miscellaneous. All right, so purchases. Purchases are going to be the items that you buy and resell to your customers. Um, if you are a manufacturer or a producer, uh, this is going to include the cost of all raw material or parts purchased for uh, manufacture and uh, finished products. Your supporting documents should show the amount paid and the amount for purchases. Uh, documents for purchase include the following. Um, it could be canceled checks, it could be cash register tapes, credit card slips, and invoices. All right, now on to expenses. So your expenses are gonna uh, be costs that you incur other than your purchases um, that you uh, incur to carry on your business. So this could be anywhere from um, office supplies, uh, utility expenses, uh, car expenses, and your uh, supporting document, of course, should show the amount that you paid and the date, uh, the date that you incurred the expense, and then also the uh, the amount that was for business uh, purposes. So again, you can document these with canceled checks, um, account statements, invoices, or credit card slips. So I'm going to pause right here for a moment because I know I've gone through a few slides. Um, does anyone have any questions about what we've discussed so far? I do need to add real quick. This is Deborah before your questions. Um, I'm trying to take attendance and I need some of you to put your full names on your screens because I'm not finding you. Like Carl's iPhone. I don't know who that is. Washira. That's, I don't have that name as being registered. Kayla Key. If you can just on your image, click on the three dots and change your name, it would be great so that I can take attendance. Thank you. And raise your hand with the reactions down below for your questions, and then she can take your questions in order. Okay, I do see one hand from Chantel Williams. Um, did you want to come off mute? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. So I, as I have a question um, for the section that you touched on regarding writing the per writing the check to yourself. So I have, um, you know, like the QuickBooks that you know tracks all of the transactions and. If I was to like do a withdrawal, um, would I, in, in, and if I didn't write the check to myself to get funds for personal, um, will I then go in and categorize that line item? That's where I kind of get mixed up on, um, like in the QuickBooks listing or, you know, the financial app I use, it, it'll ask what each transaction is. So how would I categorize that? I think it's the option that says owner's personal expense or something like that. Right, so you could you could categorize that as owner personal expense. You just want to make okay. sure that at the um, especially when when preparing your tax returns, um, yeah. if it of course was a personal expense, um, when you're preparing your Schedule C or whatever uh, business form that you file, that you're not including um, the owner's personal expense as uh, like an expense on your tax return. Okay, so even and then of course if I write the check to myself you know, that'd be some tracking as well. But if I need to, um, you know, like transfer funds or, you know, do some things like that and pay with paying myself, that would be the right way to do it. Correct. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, Winter, I see your hand. 
Yes, I, I was just trying to understand the difference between purchases and expenses. And I see under expenses, it says it does not include purchases. Um, and I'm just trying to understand a little bit better the difference. So purchases are going to be items that you, okay, so if you, if you are, if you create a product, purchases are going to be the items that you buy in order to make that product. So let's say, for example, um, you make like beauty and body products, like you, you create like a, a shea butter or something. Mm -hmm. The products that you purchase to actually mix the ingredients for your butters are going to be purchases because those items are um, purchased to actually make your products. Expenses are going to be items that they're going to, of course, they're incurred for your business, but they're not necessarily used in creating your product. So this is going to be the rent you, the, the rent you might pay for a storefront. Um, your utilities that you're going to pay to, um, your, you know, your water, gas, electric for your storefront. Um, it might be expenses that you pay for your bookkeeper or your attorney, um, any insurance that you pay for your business, those type of things. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I don't want to say this wrong, but I think it's, is it Kim Alicia? I see your hand raised. Yes, you got it right, Kim Alicia. Okay. So I just had a question. Um, early on, you mentioned a publication. Can you repeat that publication number and the title of it? Um, I'm newly starting out, so I'm just trying to get as much information as I can as far as proper record keeping and what I should, you know, have moving forward. Okay. That was publication um, 583, and it is starting a business and keeping records. Um. And also, so these slides are going to be made available to you all at the conclusion of this. I'm going to forward them to Deborah. And um, you'll see at the end of the slides, um, I, I usually include a, a few slides for resources, and there'll be a hyperlink that'll take, take you exactly to that, um, to that publication. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, no problem. Kelby, I see your hand as well. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to confirm, I know that you had met, you'd said with doing your taxes, you obviously don't have personal expenses on your, your taxes, like for writing off and whatnot. So when you're going to do your taxes, like we, you know, I use QuickBooks and I keep everything in there. Um, do I, is, is that something where you, remove those expenses or you just have it listed under personal expenses so that it's not put in with all of your other normal expenses. So I, I, you don't, you don't want, you don't have to actually go into QuickBook and remove those expenses. You just want to make sure that you categorize them as personal expenses. Okay. So that when either yourself or your um, preparer is doing your return, that they don't include that as an expense on your business return. Okay, that makes in sense. Past, yeah, in my past experience as an auditor, I found that a lot of business owners would just, um, they would provide their uh, preparer with a copy of the uh, profit and loss statement. Because again, okay. it, it, it details your income as well as your expenses. So if they okay. saw a category that said personal expenses, I would I would assume that they would know not to <laughs> include that on your return. <laughs> Okay, that makes sense. I that's what I'd been doing is it's just categorized as personal and they hadn't put it in, but I just wanted to make sure that it was all kosher, like <laughs> being done the right way. So that makes sense. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Can I touch on that as well? Yes, ma'am. Um, I have everything in QuickBooks. And if I think something might be, you know, in a certain section and I'm not sure, I'll put it under ask my accountant. And then every time that my accountant goes through things, it, you know, they'll flag that and they'll be like, what did you use this for? Um, and then they'll put it in the right category as opposed to me worrying about messing something up. <laughs> no, so that's, that's another good. option. Okay. Uh, I don't think I see any more hands. Let me just double check. Okay. 
All right, so moving on. Okay, so this next publication is, um, well, we're gonna talk about proof of certain business expenses. Um, Cause so we, we did just talk about, um, in general, um, the records that you keep for expenses, generally as long as you have like an invoice or a sales slip um, and it's dated and, and it, you know, kind of explains, you know, what, what the expense is for. Um, it's, it's usually a satisfactory uh, document for um, supporting your business expenses. But there are some expenses that you're gonna occur that require um, a bit more documentation. So if you're deducting uh, travel, entertainment, gifts, or a transportation expense, you must be able to uh, prove certain elements of the expense. So um, you'll find more additional information about that um, in publication 463, travel, entertainment, gift, and car expenses. And in this publication, it touches on, um, it touches on you know, what are considered um, accurate records, so you should keep proof um, you need in your account, your diaries, um, statement of expenses or similar records. And you should also keep documentary evidence that together with your records will support each element of an expense. So documentary evidence is generally going to be any um, documents uh, such as receipts, canceled checks or bills that support your expense. Um, and so there are some exceptions in which documentary evidence is not needed. So in those instances, um, it's not needed if you have meals or lodging expense while traveling away from your home for which you account to your employer. So you guys are business owners, so this might not necessarily apply. But for, um, for someone like me who's employed by the, uh, the IRS, um, when I'm traveling for work, as long as I, I am accounting to my employer under, we have an accountable plan um, and we use per diem rates, uh, we don't necessarily have to uh, document um, certain, certain expenses. Um, any, also that includes any expenses other than lodging that's less than $75. And then also if you have, have a transportation expense for which a receipt isn't readily available. So um, adequate evidence is going to be any documentary evidence that's ordinarily will be considered ad adequate if the amount show if it shows the amount, the date, the place, and the essential character of the expense. So for example, if you have a hotel receipt, um, that's enough to support business expense for travel if it has um, the name and location of the hotel, the date you stayed, and then it separates the amounts for your lodging, meals, and telephone calls. Um, a restaurant receipt is also going to be enough to prove an expense for a business meal if it has all the following information, uh, the name and location of the restaurant, the number of people served, uh, the date and amount of the expense. And if a charge is made for items other than food and beverage, the, the receipt also has to show that as well. So um, cancel checks are always uh, a good source of documenting expenses. I know a lot of uh, banks have moved away from like sending back canceled checks if you all still write checks. Some people don't even write checks anymore. But um, I know a few banks, they will send images of checks that were written. Um, those images will be included with your monthly bank statements. So um, a canceled check uh, together with any bill from a payee. So if you have an invoice and then a canceled check to, to show that you paid your invoice, um, that would suffice as uh, adequate records. And um, as I, I think I mentioned this early, but you wanna make sure that your records are timely kept. So you should record the elements of an expense of your business um, use at or near the time the expense was incurred um, and support it with sufficient documentary evidence. A timely kept record is, has more value than a statement prepared later um, when generally there's a lack of accurate recall. So, and that just takes me back to, you know, when I was an auditor, people would come in and they would have these returns prepared and so, you know, I'm questioning these expenses and they don't have documents to support it and they can't quite recall all the details. So again, if you are recording your expenses um, 
and making sure that you're keeping your documents um, orderly, uh, it'll, it'll definitely help you in the long run. So um, if you give your employees or clients or customers um, an expense account, you also wanna make sure that is a timely kept record. And this is true even if it's a copy um, of your account book or your diary or any uh, similar record. Okay, so. All right, so how to prove certain business expenses. Um, I included this table to share with you all today, but you can also find this in publication 463. And so this table pretty much just outlines the type of documentary evidence that you need to prove expenses for travel, gifts, and transportation. So, and then here I've provided a sample mileage log. Now I know that, you know, it's 2021 and we're probably not even keeping handwritten logs, but um, however you uh, maintain your mileage records for your car, you wanna make sure that you are documenting uh, the date of travel, where you travel to, the business purpose, um, and the number of miles that you travel. So I, I know a lot of people do this now with apps. Um, you can simply download uh, like a mileage tracker app on your phone. And before you start a business trip, you just open up the app, you hit start a trip, you drive to your destination, you end the trip, and you can provide uh, you know, a type of detail regarding you know, what the business purpose of, of the trip is for. And then, um, Every so often you can go into, uh, I guess, log into the app and, and download, uh, download, I guess they prepare spreadsheets for you of any mileage that you incur. All right. So another graphic that I provided for you go, and again, all of these are in publication 463. Um, so this graphic provides details on when transportation expense is deductible. Uh, and a, a lot of people used to get tripped up on this when I was an auditor. So depending on your starting point and your ending point, as you can see, uh, travel uh, is going to determine whether you can deduct it, an expense or not. So as you can see, traveling from your home to your regular or main job is not deductible. Um, additionally, you can't deduct transportation expense from your home to a second job. But uh, transportation expense from your main job to a temporary work location or your, from your second job to, um, or for your main job to your second job is a deductible expense. So, and I'll just give you an example. Let's say you're a real estate agent. So, and you have an office outside of your home that where you conduct, you know, you regularly conduct your business at the office outside of your home. Your trip from your home to your office isn't deductible because that's considered a commuting expense. But if you leave your office to show properties to clients, then that expense is considered a deductible expense. I hope that made sense. So I'm going to stop right here because I know I I went through a lot in these last few slides, and I am going to stop for questions. Actually, I see your hand. I see written that you shouldn't use this chart if your home is your principal place of business. Are you going to touch on that next, or what, should I ask my question? Because my my business is operated out of my home. No, so I'm not. So you can go ahead and ask your question. Okay, um, I'm an artist that paints murals and storefront signs and I will paint products like if someone rents their space and needs a physical sign to hang somewhere I'll paint that at home in the studio and then deliver it on site but typically I'm painting on site and so I'm always traveling from my home to the place of business 
all of that's deductible for me, correct? Right. So your your home is your main place of business. And then every time you travel outside of the home, whether it be to do a delivery or just to go to different clients to paint on site is, is going to be like consider your temporary work location. So that would always be deductible for you. What about to shop for supplies? That would also be a deductible expense for you. Thank you. I've sent some of you a direct message in the chat. If you could check for that, I would appreciate it. Okay, I don't think I have any more hands. All right, so I'm going to move on and we're gonna discuss documenting your assets. So assets um, used in business also have to be documented. Um, assets are the properties such as your machinery and furniture that you own and use in your businesses. Uh, you have to keep record to verify certain information about your business assets and you need to record, uh, you need records to compute the annual depreciation um, and the gain and loss when you sell the asset. So um, when I say asset, I'm gonna, any, any item that's purchased in your business that has a useful life of more than a year is gonna be considered um, an asset for tax purposes. So documents for assets uh, should include um, when and how you acquire the asset, um, the purchase price, um, the cost of any improvements that you've made to the asset, uh, deductions taken for depreciation, um, deductions taken for any casualty losses, um, such as losses resulting from fires or storms, um, how you use the asset and how you dispose of the asset, and then any selling price or expenses for the sale. So you can document um, all the things that I just mentioned, generally by making sure you keep um, any of the purchase or sales invoices. Um, if your asset happens to be real estate, you wanna make sure that you keep copies of the closing statements. Um, if you've improved your real estate, um, let's say you, you, you bought a business building and then you got it and renovated it, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you keep um, any contracts that you've had with uh, your contractors and uh, you know proof of payment, whether it's canceled checks or if you um, wired money from your bank account or, or just pay using a credit card, you wanna make sure you keep those statements as well. And whether it be a canceled check or um, electronic funds transfer, you wanna make sure that the document identifies the payee and the amount of the payment. All right, so let's talk about documenting your employment tax records. So um, there are specific employment tax records that you need to keep um, and your specific rec records should be kept uh, for employment taxes are gonna of course be your EIN, um, your employee information, which is gonna include the names, addresses, social security numbers, and occupation of employees and recipients. Uh, you're also going to want to keep any copies of form W-2 that were returned as undeliverable. And you're gonna to want to make sure you have record of the dates of employment. You're gonna also wanna make sure that you uh, have uh, document the periods for which the employees uh, were paid um, even if they were uh, paid during for sick pay or, and you also want to make sure that you document the amount and the weekly rate of payment. Also make sure that you document any tips and also um, any fair market value of income wages paid. So the records that you want to keep are going to be, are, are going to include, but not limited to any copies of the employees and recipients um, with income tax withholding allowance certificate. So that's going to be your form W-4. 
if they are an employee. Um, you're going to also want to make sure you have record of the dates and amounts of any tax deposits, copies of your employment tax returns, and records of allocated tips and records of any fringe benefits. You should keep all of your employment records for at least four years after filing the fourth quarter of the year. And you'll find more information um, regarding employment tax records in either publication 15, which is a circular E employer's guide or publication 225 uh, farmer's tax guide. So, and then you also wanna, um, gonna keep similar records for people that you hire as like contractors. You still wanna make sure that you have their name and social security number um, and proof that you pay them. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there and see if we have any questions on those last couple of slides. Assets um, and employer tax records. Okay, yes, I see a couple hands. Okay, so which I'll take yours first. Regarding the assets for like um, computer printers, how can you determine what to write down for the depreciation each year for those? So we, we actually have a publication um, that will detail that for you. Um, so, so like for computers, I've been away for example a while, but I wanna say that computers are supposed to have a useful life of like five years. So when you're documenting it, you, you just wanna make sure that you keep um, the purchase receipt for the, um, for the computer. And there are several ways that you can de depreciate uh, products in your, in your business or assets in your business. So in publication, uh, I have, off the top of my head, I believe it's publication 946. Um, will let you know the different, the various options for depreciating the, the asset. Did I answer your question? Yes, yes. I look up the publication 946. I appreciate that. Thank you. Chantal, I'll take your question. Okay. So I don't know if this question is you've gotten to this section or not, or it's coming up, but like, funding we receive like grants or any other type of funding i noticed that when filing taxes i believe like last year it mentioned to include it as like the income so do we just make sure it's categorized correctly to you know see the difference with it actually being like gross receipts and gross incomes from the business um versus like funding that is received Right. So when you categorize it in whatever whatever, whatever um, record keeping system that you use, you just want to make sure that you record it as you can record it as as grant as grant money, um, just, just so that you can differentiate what you actually receive from customers as opposed to other other sources of income that you receive. OK, OK. But it will still be filed under like income when it's time to do the filing piece of it. Right. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Kathy, I see your hand. Yes. Hi. Thank you. Um, in terms of independent contractors, I'm wondering what is the, I would guess, dollar threshold for needing to send out a 1099 to an independent contractor? That's the first question. The second one is what about non US contractors? So the dollar threshold is going to be six hundred dollars. Um, you don't have to issue a ten ninety nine miscellaneous for a contractor if you paid them under six hundred dollars. Okay. And then you said non U S contractors, it's meaning I have that that you are doing business with contractors <laughs> overseas. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, you know what, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to look into that because I'm, I'm going to have to look into that for you to find out if you even have to file a 1099 for them. 
Um, even if you don't file a 1099 for them, you want to just make sure that you have some type of documentary evidence that you did, in fact, work with the overseas company and that you paid them. So that and that would be um, a contract with them and a proof of any payment made, whether it was a wire transfer or a check would be um, sufficient evidence. OK. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, can I ask another question? Yes. So what about if you are, um, are working with a U.S. company, but they're outsourcing to um, a foreign country, a foreign uh, company? Well, if you're working with a U, if your contract is with the U.S. company, um, your payments are going to them. So they get the 1099, okay. regardless of who they pay to do the work. I thought so. I just want to just double check. Mm hmm Can I ask another question since we're on the 1099? Yes, ma'am. All right, so I just want to make sure I understand. So let's say I'm, I have someone partnering with me to do a project. And throughout the course of the year, each time, let's say if I have a bundle package and that partner does a portion of the work. So I'll then give them, you know, those proceeds. So as that, if that goes over the 600, that's when I will issue them the 1099 for all of the um, work and totals of everything, right? So you're, you're partnering with someone and you're paying them? Right. So let's say it's a project that is told I'm just throwing out like five, um, $300. But a portion of that, they're going to take care of like maybe the design piece or the logo or something. So they'll get $100 of that $300. Um, so as we go on, maybe throughout the year, that may happen like multiple times. So once I reach that 600 limit, um, you're saying to give them the 1099 of that full amount for the year that, you know, they have received from me. Right. So if they receive payment in total that exceeds $600, you, mm -hmm. and you, and you want to, you know, take a deduction for the amounts that you've paid for to them, you definitely want to make sure you issue, you issue the 1099 to them. Okay. And then my other part of that is what if there's a client who is also, you know, a business owner, and they want to track um, all of their payments that they made to me for services, I guess, for their own professional development, you know, write off and things. Would that be just capturing all of the invoices and they get that grand total of what they paid me for my services for the year? Right. So they could. Um, if, as long as you, they, you've invoiced them and they've paid your invoices. Mm hmm documenting the expense on their end would be simply just keeping copies of your invoices and proof and proof that they paid you oh okay so it's nothing i have to do like getting a whole summary like a, if it was a contracting project like a 1099 it's nothing they should reference their own invoices they have their own tracking system to sort of put together for their own purposes right okay okay thank you you're welcome kathy i see your hand now it, it just, I guess it didn't come back down. Sorry. No problem. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. I don't think I see any more um, questions. So we will move on and um, talk about um, record keeping systems. So a lot of you have mentioned um, already that you keep, um, you maintain QuickBooks which is great. Um, I thought, again, as an auditor, I've seen people who just don't maintain any records at all. And it gets me to wondering how they even prepare the tax return. But <laughs> so um, this slide is, it shows you some examples of record keeping systems that you might use for your small business. So if you still do write um, checks, uh, you'll have your checkbook. But again, um, most business, um, most banks, especially for business accounts, they'll send, cop they'll send the images of the, the checks that were cashed during the uh, statement period. Um, you also want to you know, keep a daily summary of any cash receipts. Um, you, also, you have QuickBooks. Um, there's some, the mileage apps that I mentioned. Um, I know one popular one is called Stride. I don't endorse it. The IRS doesn't endorse it. I just know that it's popular among business owners. Um, you'll have... Uh, 
Another example is your check disbursement journal, um, your depreciation worksheets, and then of course, any of your employee uh, compensation records. So whether you use any of the system, systems that I just mentioned or any alternative systems, you need to be aware that the burden of proof regarding your expenses is on you. So um, burden of proof is the responsibility to approve any entries, deductions, and statements made on your tax return. Um, and you have to be able to prove certain elements of expenses to deduct them. So generally taxpayers meet their burden of proof by having information and receipts uh, for the expenses. And you should, again, keep adequate records to prove your expenses and have sufficient evidence that will support your own statement. So um, you generally must document evidence such as receipts, any canceled checks or bills to support your expenses and any additional evidence uh, additional evidence, of course, is required for travel, entertainment, and gifts, and your automobile expenses. But you, of course, you can refer to publication 463, um, and it'll give go into more detail of how you document those um, specific expenses. And um, if you're not, if you haven't already started doing so, um, I know people keep paper files, but it's also good to maintain um, electronic records as well. So. Um, if you can scan your receipts uh, or invoices, uh, that'll be great. I know, I know um, systems like QuickBooks allow you to, you know, once you record an entry, you can um, like upload a document to support that entry. So I think it's a really a good idea um, to do that if you're not already doing so. Oh, now let's talk about record keeping timeframes. And um, so the length of time that you should keep a document depends on the action, the expense, or the event which the document records. So generally, um, you must keep your records that support an item of income, deduction, or credit shown on your tax return until the period of limitations for that tax return runs out. So generally, the period of limitation um, is the period of time in which you can amend your tax return or to claim a credit or refund, or the IRS can assess additional taxes. So the information, um, so let me just go over the, the period of limitations for you all. So you want to keep records for at least a minimum of three years uh, if from the time that you file your tax return. That's generally what we used to tell people who would come in for audits. So keep that in mind. So if you filed your 2020 return on April 15th of 2021, you wanna keep your records until April 15th of 2024. And that's the minimum amount of time. And that's generally for um, tax purposes. Now, if you are claiming um, like a bad debt deduction, um, you wanna keep those records for a minimum of like seven, of seven years. Now, if you're in the habit of not filing tax returns, you wanna keep those records indefinitely because at some point we're gonna reach out to you and ask you to file your tax return. Um, and you want to keep your employment tax records for at least four years um, after the date the tax period was, um, the taxes become due or is paid, whichever is later. Now, in regard to your assets, you generally want to keep records relating to the property until the period of limitation expires for the year in which you dispose of the property. So you should keep these records to figure any depreciation, amortization, or depletion deduction, and to figure the gain or loss uh, when you sell or otherwise dispose of the property. So if you receive property in a non-taxable exchange, uh, your basis in the property is going to be the same as the basis of the property you gave up, um, increased by any money you paid. And you must keep the records on the old property as well as on the new property, until the period of limitation expires for the year in which you dispose of the new property. When your records are no longer needed for tax purposes, you can discard them um, 
you should not discard them until you check to see if you have to keep them longer for other purposes. So for example, um, your insurance company or creditors, they might require you to keep them longer than the IRS does. So before you discard of any records, just make sure that you don't have to keep them any longer for, uh, for other purposes. All right. So in regard to um, electronic records, so during audits, um, so they, the rule for electronic records uh, kind of follows, it generally follows the same for any hard copy records. Um, so the record keeping requirements still apply when the records are kept in an, an, elect, in an electronic format. Mm, I'm getting tongue tied. So most records can be um, accepted by the IRS in electronic format, um, depending on the IRS's ability to read the software program um, that are kept on. So uh, we do, so like, for example, if you guys keep QuickBook records um, and you're audited and, you know, we don't want you to be audited, but if you are, we can, um, you can submit your records uh, you know, electronic co copies of your QuickBook records, or if you use Peachtree, I'm not sure if anyone's using Peachtree anymore, but you can also, you know, we can also accept those electronic records as well. If you are using electronic records um, and you happen to be audited, the IRS will request the electronic accounting software backup files, and will also request the administrator's username and password as they need it, um, as they're needed um, to read the most data to read most data files. Um, any temporary password can be, can be created for this process and changed after the saving information to the media. But if, um, I'm sorry, but if you have uh, administrator access to the backup file provided um, because the IRS needs to have the same access level as the administrator. So your, your backup files can be provided on a CD, DVD, or flash or jump drive. I would, I would definitely submit it on a flash or jump drive because I don't even know if we have computers with CD or DVD ROMs anymore. But um, generally, we don't accept electronic uh, trans emails of, you know, your records. And we don't send out emails, especially if it contains um, personally identifiable in information. And you also want to talk directly to your auditor assigned to your case before you submit any files, just to confirm the type of file that they're able to accept. So that pretty much um, concludes my presentation for today. As I mentioned before, I do include slides with um, publication resources. So uh, this slide includes all of the publications I mentioned here today. Uh, publication 583, which is starting, it, starting a business and keeping records. And then also publication 463, uh, travel, entertainment, gift, and car expenses. Then publication 15, Circular E, Employer's Tax Guide. And then publication 225, Farmer's Tax Guide. Um, and here are a few that I did not mention today, but are very useful. Uh, publication 535, business expenses. Publication 536, net operating losses. Publication 547, casualties, disasters, and thefts. And then publication 594, the IRS collection process. So I'm realizing that I did not include the publication for depreciation, but before I send these slides to um, Ms. Gittin, I will make sure I add a hyperlink for the depreciation publication. And if you want to learn more about record keeping, you can always visit irs.gov and search keyword record keeping. And that'll provide you with uh, a lot of information regarding business record keeping. All right, so do I have any more questions? I see one hand raised. Barsha? Yes. Um, I had a question about depreciation. Um, so let's say I bought a computer two years ago, but I did not take depreciation on it uh, when I 
the first year. How do I take care of that this year? Can I just do it for two years or I, how do I take care of that? Because we have printers, computers, scanners, which we did not take depreciation for. So you, you can't, um, you won't be able to double up depreciation on your current year's tax return. So what I would recommend you do mm -hmm. is to get with your tax professional and file an amended income tax return okay. to add that first year's depreciation for those products or for okay. those assets. Thank you. I just had another follow up on that one. Mm -hmm. Is um, you said about mileage record keeping. Um, so that means that if we use, uh, let's say a car for our business purposes, since we are taking mileage, um, we cannot do an asset depreciation on that one? Right, so I'm glad you mentioned that because I didn't talk about that during this presentation, but if you are deducting mileage for the vehicle, then mm -hmm. no, you're not gonna take depreciation because when it comes to your auto expenses, you have the option of either taking the actual expense or mileage. So okay. your actual expenses are gonna be um, expenses, that, your actual expenses like for gas, uh, repairs, tires, mm -hmm. insurance, registration, um, depreciation, any um, interest that you pay on loans for the vehicle. Mm -hmm. and. So that's your actual expenses. But if you decide that you just, you know, it's simpler for you to take mileage, mm -hmm. then you're going to just only take the mileage. Um, and they have the depreciation built into the, the mileage rate. So okay. you're not going to take, take a separate expense for that. Okay. Thank you. That was thank very you helpful. Thank you for asking that because I totally didn't discuss that during this presentation. Thank you. Just in conclusion. Here's my contact information, Anika, period T, period Pompeii at IRS.gov. Um, if you guys have any questions that come up in the future or you need some clarification on something, uh, feel free to shoot me an email.